wow. This one, this one's pretty important to me. Um, if you'll permit me for just a minute to get a little bit personal into my own history. I didn't have the greatest childhood growing up. When I was out of the house, I was constantly bullied and abused by pretty much everyone around me, and, well, I didn't have the most fantastic home life either. I didn't really experience a lot of, I guess what you'd call childlike wonderment. Moments where, as a child, through your own naivete, you end up experiencing amazing magic in the world, and the world just seems like an endless source of hope and possibilities and stuff. Not a lot of that for me, I'm afraid. Like, through my whole life, to be honest. But when I was a child, there were two key moments where I feel I did get to experience childlike wonderment. Moments that stick with me even today. The first moment was going to the zoo with my grandpa when I was three or four. He lifted me up one day outside of the elephant enclosure, and an elephant actually walked over and outstretched its trunk, and I got to pet it. And that stuck with me for a very long time. The other moment of childlike wonderment I've experienced would be playing nights into dreams. You might think it's funny, but it would be no understatement to say that playing this game, to me, has been life-changing, so I'm totally going into this bias. Just, you know, full disclosure. But playing this game felt like, to me, magic. It was what made me want to ultimately make games myself, so that some time down the road, some kid who didn't have the best childhood growing up would play it and feel a little bit of magic too, honestly. And. I mean, life has happened since then, to the point where this is what I'm doing, and progress, however large or small it may have been since then towards my dreams aside, I think ultimately playing Nights Into Dreams when I was a kid has led me towards trying to follow my passion and ultimately do this. I would probably not be here doing this without Nights Into Dreams. Well, and a flood, but you know, let's, let's focus on the happy bits that didn't completely destroy my life. The important thing to take away from this is, to me, Nights into Dreams is magic. It's something very, very special and very personal to me. And being able to show it to you, it's, um, it's very special. Now, before we get into the review proper, I do have to stress, while I am talking about the Saturn version, because that is the version I grew up with, I'm using footage from the HD release that you can get on all modern consoles nowadays, currently being played on the Xbox One, both because I had a full playthrough of it recorded, but also just because having tried to record footage of the original Saturn version, well, it just doesn't like to be recorded. Someone once told me that between the multiple processors of the Saturn, each one handled like a small chunk of every animation, and because of that, it didn't really translate to recording well. So the slightly newer HD release actually does record fairly well, so we're using that, but for all intents and purposes, I am talking about the Saturn version. I will go into the slight differences between versions later, though. Anywho, Nights into Dreams. It is one of the most important games of my life and a very, very special chunk of my childhood. It is one of the most noteworthy games on the Sega Saturn because it is one of the many attempted mascots for the Saturn, and I would say it's probably the Saturn mascot because, I mean, say what you will about Bug and Pepperacho and, you know, all the other characters and, like, I don't know, Willy Wombat? Knights was the one that really seems the most noteworthy and singularly the most Saturn. It is doing its complete own thing and it's awesome. Now, the story follows two kids, Elliot and Clarice, each children with dreams. Elliot wants to be a slightly better basketball player so that he's not completely dunked on by the blonde bully kid who's much, much better at basketball than him. And Clarice wants to sign up for an opera show because she's really that darn good a singer. Except that they've got severe confidence issues and that affects them in their dreams, leading to their whole dreams of trying to be better at basketball and singing better to turn into nightmares. And fleeing from these nightmares, they somehow bridge the gap between their own subconscious to a greater collective subconscious of the world known as Nightopia, where they have been imbued with the power of the Red Idia, a red glowy dream energy that's representative of their key character art, which I believe red stands for courage. There's five of these, and they're important to the plot, but there's not really any plot because the game just has two cutscenes for each character, and the ending one is basically the same for both. Overall, the story to this is really just a contrivance to put you into a really surreal world, more than anything. Between the levels, there's no interconnecting story, there's 
no plot development, there's no character growth, there's not really a ton of story whatsoever, and that's because this game is really more of an arcade style game. It focuses heavily on the gameplay to get through to people as opposed to the story it's trying to tell, which is ultimately to face your fears and overcome adversity, and I think become a more well-rounded person? Uh, maybe? Again, the, the story is kind of not really in this game at all, and it's for the best because seriously, the sequel to this game crammed a lot of plot down your throat, and it was really bad. So the plot, it's not great, but like I said, it's more of an arcade style game than anything, and as an arcade game that focuses on its gameplay, it is a truly remarkable experience. I have tried countless times to try and quantify what genre Nights into Dreams happens to ultimately take part in, and I don't think I've really ever succeeded. I mean, I guess I could put it under the blanket action slash arcade style thing because there is points to gather and it is the giant overarching thing that would push you towards playing this game more and more, but it really is its own unique thing. It's not really a platformer because there's not really a platforming element to it, even though there kind of is if you play it a very specific way. And I guess you can almost say it's sort of a racing game, kinda? It's a really awkward, to try and qualify game. The best I've ever been able to describe this game in a singular genre is it's a Nights into Dreams game. Like seriously, this game is its own genre. It's that different and it's that special. And I think it's really how different this game was in addition to, you know, its overall presentation and its visual stuff that really hit home to me how special it was as a game when I was a kid and even now. I suppose the best way to really talk about how this game plays and, and how you play this game is just to go through a standard run of at least the first chunk of a level. Once you get into a level, you will proceed to fall from the sky and get mobbed by every enemy ever, robbing you of all of your magical dream personality essences because you can only have one and having all of them means that you can fight the boss, so you're not allowed to have them. But they can't take your magical red one, which is what makes you so awesome. Armed with your red one, you then see a nearby gazebo looking thing with this androgynous purple jester guy hanging out inside, and you go to say hi, except whoa! Now you're all like fused and stuff, and you can fly and do tricks and stunt, and it's awesome. You have now just met the titular knights, this awesome purple jester guy who, if you actually go into the backstory, is one of the nightmare creatures, but he's fighting for good because he's sentient. I've, I've read way too much into the backstory of this game through comic books and other stuff. Fun fact, blonde basketball dude from the nightmare, he was a major villain in the comic books because they really needed to come up with some kind of plot that this game had because this game didn't have that much of one. It was a bit of a reach, but still, but still. Anyway, now that you have Knights' power, you have a timer above your head. It's important that you adhere to this timer and complete your objective, because if you don't, you defuse with him, and then you have to run back and try and fuse with him again, and if you don't do it fast enough, you will be hunted down and executed by the worst villain of all time, this goofy egg-looking clock thingy. Yeah, just, just a goofy egg-looking clock thingy. Move along. Now, as you are fused with knights, you have one objective complete the various laps around the 3D environment that has now been sort of morphed into a 2D, almost on rails sort of course. In order to complete your objective, you have to gather 20 blue sphere things, known as chips, and deliver them to these weird octopus dome things that have captured your dream energy. After you overload them with 20 blue chips, you can then complete the lap and return to the gazebo, to start the next lap before you run out of time, at least if you want to play this game on a very basic level. See, the thing is, once you actually get your dream energy back, but before you return it to the starting point, it then gives you a giant score multiplier. And that's where this game, on a fundamental gameplay arcade aspect, gets really, really damn interesting. Because you have to measure risk versus reward in regards to whether or not you have time to try and get as many points as possible, or to bank all the points you have earned thus far. Because as we've established, you will defuse with knights if you run out of time, and if you do that, all the points you've earned on this lap of the course, gone. So, you have to figure out, can you make an extra lap of the course to gain as many points as possible, allowing you to get a bigger score and just become the ultimate dream point champion guy? Or do you just try and take a more humble score, but it's a lot safer? It's really up to you. But what's interesting is, every lap sort of has hidden secrets and alternate routes and stuff that usually give you alternate paths with alternate scoring potentials. For example, one chunk of a lap might give you more blue chips, but if you happen to take a slightly different alternate chunk of said path, 
you might get more stars. And stars, while they cannot give you the dream energy to give you a multiplier, which are added up at the end of your circuit, to give you an even bigger multiplier that can really balloon your score. But that is provided that you play nice and you don't hurt too much the wildlife. More on that later. Once you grab the dream energy and return to the start point, you then start a secondary circuit with different obstacles, different enemies, and a different route through the world. And it's really interesting to see how this giant 3D environment was sort of sectioned off into these small 2D spaces with great amounts of verticality and things hidden about them. But, like I said at the beginning, if you play a very specific way, it can also kind of be a platformer. See, theoretically, if you played it an exact specific way, you don't necessarily have to fuse with knights at all until the end. Once you gather the final dream energy, which I believe is the blue one, you then proceed to fight the boss. However, until that time, you don't strictly have to fuse with knights. You could theoretically run around on foot being chased by the egg clock the entire time, and even though that thing will speed up and you can attack it a couple times before it becomes invincible, if you understand the world layout, you could, at least in most cases, be able to gather all the dream energies on foot. There are a couple exceptions where you can't jump high enough, even with a triple jump, but you could do it on foot. In fact, one level actually has a secret that gives you basically unlimited points if you do it that way. It's really interesting that there is this kind of like weird, quirky, alternative way to play the game and fully explore the depths of the 3D world. And it's important that this is available to you because you can't otherwise really explore these environments. And it's sad because if you play the way that the game is sort of intended by fusing with your purple jester friend flying around, collecting points, gathering dream energy, and moving on, you only get to see small 2D side sections of a much bigger three-dimensional world. Whereas if you run around and jump as your kids, you're not going to get a huge score multiplier, but you see a lot more of the world. You find tons of secrets you otherwise wouldn't notice. A great example of this is the third world on the boys route. During one of the later laps, you end up having to sort of weave in and out of this like half finished constructed tower, but if you just run there as Elliot, well, there's a giant elevator there that you can just stand in and get risen to the top, and there's points up there, and the egg clock can't get you up there, and there's actually like secrets and stuff if you just explore the world beyond just trying to get a score. It's really interesting that they kind of try and emphasize alternate, more out-of-the-box ways of playing than just the way they've designed the game to work. Sure, the cynic in me could basically say that most of this is entirely pointless because there's no real value to it, and that it feels heavily underutilized because there's nothing really necessitating any of this exploration, but having seen them actually do that in the sequel, I'm okay with it being a fun little extra way to play the game that wasn't necessarily intended, but still it's appreciated that they built a world that you can fully explore if you want to. And because you're constantly hounded by a stalking egg clock that will wake you up from your dream, you know, there's always a bit of tension and there's always an antagonist chasing you. It's really interesting. And while you're doing that, you can actually come into contact with something that made this game pretty groundbreaking for the time. Yeah, this game was actually pretty groundbreaking for a few reasons, but first of all, there are these little eggs all over the map. And if you touch them, you'll hatch a little fairy guy known as a Nitopian. These Nitopians are sort of like the native creatures of these worlds. And this is the start of Sega exploring artificial life, for lack of a better term. Yeah, all of those people who loved playing with the KOs in Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2, yeah, those were actually a holdover from Nights into Dreams including modifying their limbs. If you were to attack an opponent and fling them at one of these guys, they would actually develop traits based on the opponents thrown at them. Kind of like trying to feed a KO a dragon or a cheetah or whatever you do in Sonic Adventure. It's pretty cool that they added this. However, there is a little bit of an issue with this being built into the main game. You might recall how I mentioned stars only really give you a huge point modifier if you're nice to the local wildlife. Well, if any of these guys get hurt, in any lap before you cash in that point multiplier, yeah, they kind of take that away. Because these are the guys who actually give it to you. There's a little guy hanging out above the starting point gazebo with a sign, and if you high-five him during one of the last two laps, he'll give you a point modifier based on all the stars you get. If you kill any of his friends, he doesn't show up. And that actually adds an extra layer of depth and complication to trying to score really big in this game. Seriously, trying to build an excellent score in this game really wildly complicated. And while we're on the subject of this game being pretty groundbreaking, what if I told you that modern controller design 
was all thanks to this game. You might think I'm crazy to say this, but the original Sega Saturn release came with this giant controller that was one of the first analog control designs. Now granted it felt like an analog controller being pasted over top of a D-pad, but it was a start. But if you look at the actual design of this giant 3D controller, as it was called, it actually basically looks like a prototype Dreamcast controller. And the Dreamcast controller, of course, was the inspiration for the Xbox controller design, which would then inspire the Xbox 360 and Xbox One to controllers today. It all came back to this groundbreaking game, even though no one really knows about it. Kind of a shame, but it's another fun little thing I like about this game, just in regards to how special it is. Going back to the worlds and how they're set up, what's really cool about it is every single world has different, I don't want to say gimmicks, but different special moments that kind of recontextualize how the game is played a little bit. In the first level of Elliot's course, during the final lap, you are taken into this cave that is completely flooded with water. And in doing so, suddenly the camera snaps behind Knights' back and he turns into a dolphin. And you kind of have to swim through and gather points and it's pretty much entirely on rails, but it's a neat little change. A similar thing happens during Clarice's third world, where you fire Knights out of a cannon and you have to guide his path from behind in a third person camera. Now they're not all perfect, because these do kind of fundamentally change how the game is played, some of them actually don't control particularly well. Uh, the best example I can think of being the last lap of the final level on Elliot's route, which contains like this giant roller coaster that has basically no control, because you can wiggle the control stick and the thing will move, but it doesn't really move in regards to how you move the control stick, it's basically random. And what sucks, especially about that one, is it actually takes up basically the entire timeline of one entire lap of that entire course. So basically you have to get the dream energy during that one run and not screw up because this stupid roller coaster ride takes way too long. They're not perfect, but it's interesting that they tried to vary up every lap in this game by adding something a little bit special, be it just in the environment or what you have to do or the layout of all the points or even changing up how the game is played. It's a great way to give each lap and each world its own personality because each one of these moments where Knights changes shape and ultimately mechanics to control is entirely unique to that world. They're kind of 50-50 in terms of quality, but still, every world feels unique and different, both in terms of gameplay and style. These environments, they're kind of filled with enemies, and you can avoid them certainly, but that doesn't mean they're gonna let you off easy. And you don't have a ton of attacking options in this game, you've got a total of two. The first one being your drill dash. You have an energy bar that is how much energy you have, and by dashing you move a lot faster, which can be used to great effect to gain a higher point multiplier by getting you around the environment faster, but if you collide with enemies, you will take them out. For the most part, some enemies have a little bit of a wonky hitbox, full disclosure, but your alternative attack is that little sparkly trail following behind you. If you happen to create a loop with them, you will perform what is known as a paraloop and basically create a black hole of death and destruction and kill everything in the vicinity, as well as pulling anything that contains points towards you. Yeah, it's a great move, especially especially if you want alternate movement options to help emphasize score attacking, which, again, is, as an arcade style game, kind of the core goal here. There are a couple other things that you can do to get more points. For example, there is a specific stunt ring that once you fly through it, it activates stunt mode. Your little sparkly light trail turns to like a solid yellow ribbon, and by holding the L and R buttons down, you can perform various stunts, and this is the only time those stunts are ever actually of any value in the game, but still, but still. That I can give you a bit of a point multiplier, but in doing so you have to abandon chaining stuff, so it's, again, risk versus reward. It takes time and you have to abandon whatever point multiplier you have immediately for more point. Whether that's a terribly effective choice or not, that's really up to you, but still, it's neat that they tried something there, and tried to sort of make your character's goofy, carefree personality, as seen in some of the animations your character has, to really mean something in terms of gameplay, even if it's such a small thing that ultimately didn't pan out all that well. Now that you've completed the five courses of each world, you are teleported to the boss battle, where you have to take them out within a set period of time. Now, unlike the main chunk of the courses, if you run out of time here, it's game over and you gotta start the level again. And the only score multiplier you can get from this is to defeat your opponent really fast, which will in turn, at best, double your total score for the entire level. That's not insignificant. Each of the six bosses in the standard stages are entirely different, which is really interesting. The first boss on Elliot its course, for example, is basically pushing back this giant balloon lady until she pops. The first boss from Clarice's is a giant segmented dragon whose ultimate goal is to 
cause its head to collapse into its tail and make it explode. Although if you're really, really exceptionally skilled, you can take it out in one move. It's really, really awkward to do so, but you can do it. And they're still varied after that. You've got one that's basically juggling an enemy until he's dead, provided you can avoid his initial volley of attacks. There's one that will constantly escape your attacks and just jump around the environment, so your whole goal is to try and get around and modify the environment so he has nowhere to run to. There's one that's literally just trying to avoid attacks and plunge yourself through him, using depth through cannon launchers that look like fish. And then of course, like every good game, there is the clone battle, which honestly is probably the most interesting fight of the game, because it's really interesting to try and use a character that really isn't designed for combat to fight a character that's not really designed by combat. The only real way to attack him is to do that sparkly loop move to create a sort of black hole to eat him while he does the same to you, which is pretty interesting because it basically evolves into a giant game of chicken trying to get the drop on your opponent before he loops you. I love that fight a lot. Now what's really interesting is you can actually set up in the game what bosses you fight, to an extent. Every level has a dedicated boss fight, of course, however if you go into these settings you can actually change the bosses to be randomized. Unfortunately, this means that if you're bad against one boss you could potentially run into that boss on your best run and get a terrible multiplier for the level, but on the other hand it could mean that you run into your best boss and get an insane multiplier for your level. Unfortunately not having control over that kind of sucks, It's an, again, it's another one of those things that I think kind of hurts it as a score attack sort of game, but at the same time if you're okay with trying to roll the dice whether or not you're ultimately going to get a good boss fight on your best run, it's an interesting way to vary things up. There are a grand total of seven levels in this game. Elliot and Clarice each have three levels each with a fourth level available to both of them, although it's identical between the two, and it's a little bit different than the main levels, but it's also the final level, so that kind of makes sense, at least sort of from a thematic perspective. Again, it's one of the few chunks of the game that actually feels like it sort of injects story into it. But every single level is different and has its own sort of deeper theming to it, other than its environmental design. And I think that's really cool. And you can see that inside every single level's name and description. Overall, this is a game about varied experiences. However, that is one of my biggest issues about this game. The game plays completely smooth on a Sega Saturn controller. Even if you're just using the old school classic Saturn controller as opposed to the nice giant 3D controller, in fact, sometimes I kind of prefer that controller for this game, it plays nice and smooth, which is fantastic. The aerial acrobatics and everything, it just flows really, really nicely, especially when it comes to actual score attacking. This leads to my biggest issue with the game, and I guess it's the biggest non-complaint I could have about it, but I just wish there was more. Seven levels is really not that much, and if you play through the entire game, even without a ton of experience, you could probably beat this game in an hour and a half pretty readily. I can beat this game in less than an hour, significantly so if I'm not actually trying to gather score and I'm actually just trying to beat the game as fast as possible, but still, even trying to get as maximized a score as you possibly can, you're going to be through this game game pretty quick, and the real staying power is the exploration, the looking for things in the environment, the secrets, the little easter eggs, as well as building up score. And if that, combined with the core experience, is not for you, then this game is going to fall entirely flat, because as well as it does play, I think, for the most part, it really doesn't have that much content. And it being a very, very niche style game, it's already not going to appeal to a lot of people, I recognize. But that said, this game is something well and truly unique. I've never played anything that's quite like it. It's not a platformer, it's not an arcade game, it's not a flight sim, it's not an on-rail shooter, it's not really anything but Nights into Dreams. And I think that's fantastic. I just wish there was a bit more. But it's still one of the most magical and interesting games I've ever played, and I quite enjoy it from a gameplay perspective. Now that said, Again, I thought I should bring this up. Some mild version differences because we aren't strictly playing the Saturn version. There was a demo on the Sega Saturn called Christmas Nights into Dreams. It was Christmas themed. I did a playthrough of it and I'll bring it up again in a sec. There was a PS2 release which unfortunately I do not have. It's exclusive to Japan but someday I want to get a copy of that. There was of course also this version, the HD version that's available on Xbox 360, PS3, playable on PS4 I think, playable on Xbox One for sure. It's on Steam. I'm pretty sure it was like on the Wii and Wii U. It's pretty much available on everything and this version actually does some things differently. First 
first of all, it's kind of a compilation containing the Saturn version, as well as an up version of the PS2 version. Now that said, I should note that if you're a bit of a veteran to this game, playing the PS2 version like I'm doing here for the sake of recording well, it doesn't play very well. When it launched, it was basically completely unplayable because the controls just didn't have the same smoothness to the original game. It's since been patched to be a lot better, but again, if you're experienced, you're gonna notice it. That said, if you're not experienced with this game, it'll probably play fine in this mode. But if you are, stick to the Saturn version. It might not look quite as nice as the PS2 iteration that I'm playing here, but it'll play infinitely better. As a compilation, it also contains the aforementioned Christmas-themed Sega Saturn demo, Christmas Nights. However, I have to take umbrage with this. I'm gonna do a review of that game eventually myself, but Christmas Nights Into Dreams was a special entity in and of itself. It was a one-level demo containing Clarice's first mission, but it was also playable by Elliot if you wanted. And while that sounds kind of underwhelming, a one-level demo, you know, why add it to this compilation? Well, the thing is, while it was a one-level demo, it had arguably as much content as the full game, maybe even more. As the name indicates, it was kind of Christmas-themed, and if your system's clock was set to Christmas Day, it would have a different, basically, motif for the game. If you set it to New Year's, it would have a different motif. If you said to April Fools, you would play as the villain version of Knights, Rila. There was a ton of awesome little extra bonus stuff in here, including every time you beat the level, you get like a scratch card that would unlock extra bonus stuff on top of that. It was really awesome. So you're probably asking, why am I taking issue with it being in this compilation? Well, while it does have Christmas Nights in here, and while it does have the features of the clock, it doesn't have the extras. And some of those extras that you could unlock from the scratch card included like like the clock settings just available whenever you want it as just an on off switch as well as unlockable art and stuff which actually was included in this game but that's the extent of all the extras gone is the 3d sonic into dreams mode that existed on the saturn gone is the ability to basically use whatever motif based on around the clock that you wanted whenever you wanted you had to actually set your system clock now and that annoys me because what made that demo so special was the fact that it had all this content and it was essentially gutted from this version but that said this version does also contain a soundtrack and art and stuff that was also available in the other versions but still you know it does have some extras just not really the significant interesting ones that it should have for it to be a true and proper port at least of the demo that this also contains but regardless of what version you play nights into dreams is a very special very amazing game and while it's certainly not going to appeal to a lot of people it's a very niche game i love this game quite quite a lot, and being able to play it again, well, that's that's very special to me in terms of gameplay. The overall presentation to Nights Into Dreams is pretty amazing. Each world has its own different visual flares to it. You've got a snowy mountaintop, you've got a really mysterious jungle, you have a giant water park, you've got nice Alps mountain type areas, you have a entire world that's basically made of jello. Okay, if that doesn't sell this game, I don't know what does. The animations are nice and smooth, and it really does feel very nice to fly around as knights. Basically, everything about this game just oozes personality and uniqueness. The overall soundtrack to this game is legendary. First and foremost, you remember all those artificial life Nitopians I talked about a little while ago? Yeah, they actually changed the soundtrack too. Basically every world has like, I think something like five different iterations of every area's soundtrack, just depending on the overall mood based on how many of them are alive and how well they're thriving in this environment. The more of them there are, the happier the soundtrack is, the less the slightly darker the soundtrack gets. But it's really interesting to see all these different iterations of the same song. And if that didn't really hit it off how awesome the soundtrack is, well, for me, I honestly don't remember the names of the environments all that well. I always remember the names of the levels based on the names on the soundtrack. And this game was pretty amazing because if you took this and you put it into your PC on the Saturn, you got the entire soundtrack for free. In fact, the people who made this game understood that and they actually added like desktop backgrounds, concept art, uh, I think there was like a screen saver and some like icons and stuff. They really did load this disc with all sorts of extras just so that you could enjoy more of it. Which is pretty cool, especially considering that the soundtrack is really great and you'll be humming the tunes if you play this game for any period of time. Basically the soundtrack is so awesome that it punctuates everything else about this game that makes it amazing. Now if you want a copy of Nights Into Dreams, cheapest copy I'm seeing right now, disc only, no guarantees, $50. And I gotta admit, that seems a bit high for the Saturn. 
just based on the amount of content you're going to get. Like I said, there's basically seven levels, so that might not exactly be worth it to you. To me, it absolutely is, though. The Japanese copies are, of course, significantly cheaper, and the one that actually comes with the proper 3D controller in its giant box that I have is going to be significantly more expensive. Sitting at about $150 from what I can tell. Wow, that went up in price since I got mine. But, of course, the most affordable and easiest to acquire is the digital copy, which at most will cost you $15, although I've seen it drop to like a dollar when it's on sale, and for that you should absolutely give it a go, because it's totally worth a dollar just to see something as truly special and as magical as Nights into Dreams. This is, bar none, I think probably the most defining game on the Sega Saturn. It was completely different, and it was truly something magical. And that, in and of itself, is how I would describe the awesome console it was on. No one had a Sega Saturn, but that didn't mean it didn't do amazing things. Yes, this game is very, very niche, but it's still looked back on fondly by a bunch of people. So much so that Nights was included as a cameo in pretty much every Sonic game, starting with Sonic Adventure. It had a Game Boy Advanced connected minigame through the GameCube with Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg, as well as a cameo in Billy Hatcher, uh, multiple Sega All-Stars crossover nonsense. It had half the game dedicated to Sonic Pinball Party, and seriously, that was the best part of Sonic Pinball Party. Go play the Knights Pinball and Sonic Pinball Party. That is like the second greatest pinball game I have ever played, next to the amazing Super Robot Pinball. My entire point about this is, Nights into Dreams was truly something special. And while it won't appeal to a lot of people because of how niche it is, for those of you that had the chance to experience this game, you know how truly amazing Nights into Dreams is. For me, this was one of the most defining games of my entire life. It's one that changed the course of my entire life and taught me that maybe there was a little bit of magic in this world and maybe I could bring some magic to this world myself by following my own dreams. While world circumstances have kind of changed my path to doing this, I'd like to think I'm still doing my part to do so, and I'm going to continue to do my best here to do this for you. But that was Nights into Dreams, one of the most special and important games in my life, and truly one of the most magical. And I hope that my words here have at least made you consider trying to experience some of the magic yourself. Thank you. Because he has to run back and grab his cloak every time you attack him. Which means if you just get in between him and his cloak, you can juggle him. Kind of forever, and it's the best. Boop. Boop. Done. Woo! Done. <laughs> it is a very fun game to watch, and it's definitely a very interesting one.